So, first of all, this is a uh, kind of a surreal experience being here. I just walked to CES floor and my, if someone told me it was four miles long, I would not have worn new shoes. Um, <laughs> and uh, the last time I was here was 13 years ago and uh, at CES, um, to the day actually, and I expected a much smaller room. <laughs> so, uh, when I was here 13 years ago, ironically, I was here with the technology that was um, embedding uh, chips and televisions, making televisions interactive and directly connected to the internet. Um, and as they say, sometimes things come too fast, and uh, even though we won best at CES that year, uh, we shut down a year later and I was looking for a job. So, <laughs> now 13 years later, uh, we're here at CES again, and we're talking about the most innovative fracture that we've seen in the media business, which is really due to the creation of interactive and connected TVs. Um, and it's, you know, in this session, uh, it was really great earlier to hear from the panelists about the future of content, especially from other studios and how they look at it. What I want to talk to you about primarily today is, is how studios will actually really need to rethink the way that we do business. Um, in light of what we've seen, you know, here at CES and obviously technology growth over the years, um, these changes uh, have created a big fracture and um, some of us, I think, are ready for it. And, Others may not exactly be. So, um, because things have changed, um, all we need to realize is that the power has shifted to the consumer. Um, and that's really the simplest way to say it. Unfortunately, the studios and the networks have completely forgotten what our real jobs are. Our jobs are to help, I'll, I'll call you the consumer, I think some of us here are the consumer, some are probably the suppliers, but I'll, I'll, I'll uh, refer to it as the consumer, but really it's to help the consumer, you guys. And it's to help you get the content you want, when you want it, and the price you want to pay for it. Um, and we have to realize that those days of just putting 500 channels of force-fed TV, or just putting a movie in movie theaters, knowing that consumers will be there because they have no other choice, are, are over. The power is now in your hands, the consumer's hands. And um, first, actually, I, in order to kind of understand this, I want to take back, uh, take a step back in history. Um, and kind of walk through a world uh, that the studios lived in um, 100 years ago. So, um, at the top of the model is a parent company, and the large parent company over the years at some point decided to get into movie and television businesses. Uh, so the, these parent companies acquired television studios, film studios, um, which operated independent of one another, and still do to this day. And for most, much of the, the last century, um, these eight or so studios have competed with one another um, and competed effectively with one another to get their movies on your screens, both in your theaters and on your TV screens. Um, and when I say your theaters, you're the ones paying the tickets. Um, and when I say compete, I actually don't really mean compete. I kind of mean ha happily coexisted because there was just enough real estate for those eight studios to continue to work in harmony and own your screens. And so in the process, studios have built up major legacy structures. And that's the model, in my opinion, that still exists around those studios today. But now, the studios are facing real competition. Um, and it's not just from people like us, which are kind of new models that were created in today's world, like relativity, but also from other industries. Gaming, social media, online short-form content. The studios are actually in a very sticky situation. For the first time, they actually have to give the consumer back the power. The consumer now controls the screen. Not that. And adaptation, I think as we all know, is not something that 100-year-old industries with 100-year-old companies are particularly good at. They don't do very well at all, in fact, but they're going to have to. The real estate that used to be controlled by the MSOs, DirecTV, Time Warner, etc., and by the theaters is now infinite. If you have a smartphone or a computer, you can make content available to the world. And thus, the studios in many ways are actually competing with the consumer today. And who knows you better than you? So you get to watch what you want to watch. You get to watch it when you want to watch it. And you get to control how you watch it. And thanks to new and innovative technologies, uh, a lot that we've seen here today, there are now more ways than ever to get content. Whether that's streaming, buying, renting, digital, not digital, over the top, under the top, there's many more ways to pay as well. The consumer is finally in control of his own destiny, which is actually something that ironically I sat up here 13 years ago trying to do. Um, so this leaves all studios in a tough spot. Um, and it begs the question, will studios survive? The 
the simple answer, in my opinion, is, is yes, they will, although the real answer is, is a little more complicated than that. Um, the bottom line of it is that we in the industry, we as the studios, we as the content creators, need to welcome the new world. We need to understand and partner with many of the technologies that you're seeing at this show, not compete with them, not try and shut them down. Um, if we as an industry actually embrace them and work with them rather than against them, um, consumers will not only get what they want when they want it, but also the coexistence of large, well-funded studios and the consumer's real-time voice will allow us as an industry to create content in a way that's never before been possible. This is real-time, user-inspired content. Content that we know the consumer will want and we know that the consumer will like before we give it to them. Not a hundred million dollars later, the Monday after box office and opening weekend, we see how the box office did, pull the audience, and then we know. Not the day after the worldwide television premiere of a show, $10 million later, when we finally look at how many people actually watched it. Instead, before, before it's aired or shown, we can have the consumer's voice, your voice, in the content, which will be the biggest win-win that our industry has ever seen. In order to accomplish this, however, we need to be willing to change the way we see ourselves, which is tough for us as an industry. We can't just be focused on making movies and TV anymore. We, we need to be content engines. We cannot fight the innovation, we need to embrace it. And we need to kind of break down the walls that exist in every one of these legacy systems and structures today to allow all content to coexist happily. That does not occur in these legacy structures at all today. What does this actually mean though? We do still need to make film and TV. That's not going away. The traditional model will still be there. Those businesses aren't going anywhere. But we also need to make other kinds of content as well, and lots of it. And then we need to make all of this content, movies and TV included, available how, when, and where consumers want to watch it. For example, if I turn on my TV, it should be this easy to get the content I want from a studio, as an example. And for this example, well, we'll use relativity, if that's okay with you guys. <laughs> With one click of a button, I should have access to every film Relativity has ever made, available in perpetuity. I should be able to watch all of our shows after they've aired on TV, as well as pilots that haven't made it into TV yet, including the 50 pilots we've already shot. And I should be able to access all the content we are creating at Relativity Sports, with our Relativity Sports clients, our Relativity Fashion clients, and so on and so forth. And even through our new partnership with Major League Gaming. Going back actually to sports for a minute, we already have 11 series in production, all built around 400 pro athletes. We will be the only studio programming original sports content other than what you watch today as games. And we've also begun creating short form content that comes from user generated requests. Turning back to gaming, we uh, have a partnership with Major League Gaming, the fastest growing league in the world. It has 54 million hours of online video watched in 2013 which is three times more than last year's March Madness. This partnership for us, I think, for the industry, is an unprecedented opportunity to actually connect with millions of people looking for new forms of content and give them exactly what they want. The other thing that MLG does incredibly well is part of the brand. As you can see from the slide, it's been incredible. It's it re unprecedented results in the media world, something that I've never heard of or seen, as you can see on our left. And these are the kind of results that traditional advertising cannot give a brand anymore. And this is another area where innovation is absolutely necessary. As broken as the content creation model is, the way that studios and networks have worked with brands in the past is even more fractured. Brands can no longer be clients, brands must be content partners, involved in the creation of content from the very start. Not just buying airtime for commercials that 85% of American now DVRs. As you can see, we've already begun this successfully brand partnership strategy with MLG, and very soon we'll be announcing a new brand and entertainment strategy that we actually think will turn the entire ad world upside down. We believe that everything that I just talked about should be available to any consumer through every device, whether it's an internet connection, whether it's an Xbox, a Roku, a computer, a Hulu, a subscription, or a non-subscription. And you should be able to pay only what you want to pay for. Some of the content will be free, some of it will be available by subscription, some of it will be a one-time purchase for sale or rental. Now, I think some of you probably are saying, well, this is a no-brainer, it's really easy. And I'm sure we're probably not the only studio that's thought of this. But I think we are the only ones that can actually do it, and here's why. 
So the traditional studios, the ones that were built under the old model, are, are paralyzed by the legacy structures they built up over the last hundred years. They don't have the agility to fundamentally restructure the entire basis of their businesses that we actually need to do in order to actually make that a reality. To have film, television, sports, gaming, all content completely open and working together. And even if they did, many of the studios are locked in these ancient licensing deals with pay TV providers and such that actually make it impossible for them to enter into the digital world this way. It's hard enough to get a big ship moving forward in one direction, but it's even harder to get that ship to stop, turn around, and go forward in a whole new direction. We all saw how well that worked out for the Titanic. <laughs> but relativity, I obviously believe I'm a little bit biased, is a little bit different, in part because we launched in 2004, in the middle of the digital age. And we have three significant advantages because of that. First, we have, and we'll continue to partner with new distribution technologies. We're not locked into those ancient deals. Next, we want our content to be available everywhere as soon as possible, and that's built into the fundamental basis of our strategy. Finally, we have the various business units and partnerships in place right now that actually allow us to produce all of the content that this proposition requires, from film to television to sports to fashion to gaming and more. In fact, part of the very reason that we're here as a company at CES is because we're actually talking to and negotiating with some of the world's leading tech companies about turning our vision for what we now call the My Platform into a reality. And we're committed to making this happen very soon. But while we're incredibly excited about this idea, we also realize that it's just a step in part of a much longer evolution and adaptation. You see, every time a new technology has come out in our industry, um, anything like what we're seeing today, we've had to adapt. And the irony is that every time a new technology does come out, the studios fight it with all vigor. Um, and yet, it's been the biggest growth driver for them each time they fight it. The DVD, for example, was originally called by the studios the Studio Killer. And it, they fought as hard as they could to stop DVDs. And it turned out to be the single biggest growth by multiples that the industry had ever seen. When Netflix was first introduced, and it was just a DVD mail order and company, uh, and we signed a very large deal with them and created something called the SVOD window, um, at, or, or SV, uh, VOD window, the large studios, meanwhile, and prior to, resisted Netflix again with all vigor. And I know today that seems silly, but this was just a few years ago. And in fact, there were specific mandates within studios that they would not work with Netflix. They could not provide any content from the top down to Netflix. And yet if you look back, and you can even find quotes from, and I'm not going to name names, but CEOs and chairmen of large media companies call Netflix a joke, a flash in the pan, no competition, not worried about it. Today Netflix is a $21 billion company. So innovation, it's such an easy principle, adapt or die, but our industry has always been scared. Even though history shows that every major evolution in our business, despite those fears, leads to exponential growth, our industry is scared. So the key is to embrace disruption, change early, don't react to it decades later. And so while it may be tempting to take baby steps, um, it relatively we've never been so good at that. So we're taking giant leaps. So I look forward to talking a little bit more about this with, with Andy. Um, I do feel it's apropos to leave you guys with my favorite quote by a very smart man who, who wasn't scared to take on large established institutions. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> about innovative models. We're doing a little innovative modeling ourselves. Ryan's going to be available post-presentation for a live Twitter chat. Uh, you could already see that we've been soliciting questions really the past few days via social media. Uh, hashtag relativity at CES. Maybe we could work one in under the wire. Uh, but we'll look to see if we can get a question now uh, from Twitter. But first, Mike. Um, I have a really important Twitter question first. Okay. Can I get some water? <laughs> yes, can we make that happen? Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, 
know the CS for it's, you know, I, I can imagine it's a lot of mileage, I understand. Um, this is a bold vision. The question is... As long as it's heavy, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> No product endorsement here. We'll put a black bar on the, the water bottle. Anyway, I was saying this is a very bold vision. The, the, the first quick and simple question is, how close are we to seeing this in action? Or could we, is this something we're going to see from relativity in 2014? Um, you know, I, 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 uh, it's a tough question to answer only because if we know particularly we're dealing with technology, it's not always a predictable note. It doesn't always go on schedule. Our goal is to have it out in 2014. Um, the reason I'm hesitant is, you know, we are a partial tech company, but a lot of the components are relying on outside forces. So our goal is to have this launched and out in 2014. Gotcha. Different swap in the waters. Perfect. Thank you. Much better. <laughs> in terms of this thing that you're doing, does it is rel does relativity become the brand for consumers? Because I, I, with all due respect to some great movies and TV shows, they may not necessarily be familiar with the brand behind it. Yeah, the brand actually isn't the, the important part. Actually, the brand behind it is going to be other brands. The way we look at it is as the industry changes and brands that are brands that need to be, uh, that are known to either uh, known by or need to be known by the consumer will actually be the brand that are driving it. Relativity as a name is not key. That's why right now we're referring to it as the My Everything platform. It's, it's relativity is the content engine that will supply content and hopefully you know cross spectrum, cross platform, long form, short form. But the actual brands that will be behind it will be very well known, established brands kind of outside of the media business. As you said in your presentation, you're able to do this in a way studios, the traditional studios, are are, are not because they're encumbered by sort of legacy structures. What, can you give a specific example for those who might not be familiar with, you know, what is a way that you're able to act in a way that a traditional studio cannot, because you're not so incumbent? Sure, I mean, I can give one, I give a lot, I give one that's just a very straightforward symbol. So, uh, these studios, many of you probably know, and there might be studio people here. Um, ah, come on, we're all friends. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, you think you were in Hollywood for <laughs> um, They're all friends. Uh, so, um, you know, the studios deals, they're, they're the pay window, which is, you know, two 12 month windows in, in the first uh, cycle of a film, is a very important part of a film's uh, revenue and profit. And in fact, it can represent 30 or 40% of the, the net margin on the bottom line. So, before Netflix, there was HBO Showtime and Stars, and now Netflix is obviously a competitor. The studios have had these long-term deals with HBO Showtime and Stars, and um, you know we all heard a lot a couple of years ago about the DVD crashing and that it was ruining the economics of the studio business, and that digital wasn't going to make up for the differential. And the truth is that that's exa not exactly true. I think from what we've seen, digital more than makes up for the, differ the, the differential. The problem is that the way their deals were written back with the pay TV deals um, when DVD was such a big uh, window, they didn't envision a digital window. So the contracts don't allow them to have EST, electronic sell through pay-per-view, basically any other form of their film on television while those two windows are playing. So no I don't, no Apple, no Amazon, you know, no Hulu, no, no, and just on the pay window, which they get no incremental money for, but their contract no money for how many times the consumer watches it. So for us, that's half of the first cycle that we're able to sell on digital, on you know, pay, uh, when consumers want it. And if you go on iTunes, you'll never see one of our movies disappear off iTunes. You'll see every other studios on and off all the time. And that changes the entire economics, meaning they, and they can't go put it on another platform. One more question for me before I uh, ask a colleague to, to uh, cull from social media for us to, to get one last question. Uh, are you able, though, I understand why you're not as encumbered as these older studios, but the question is, when you're doing these innovative new deals, are they as rich as the deals that keep the studios from making these new deals? Well, without going back to that example, without disclosing what the amount is, I can tell you that we as a studio have this um, other than, than, well, we as a distribution company in the studio, we have the single highest rate card in any studio. So we actually get paid more than the studios do for the same window. Not a bad arrangement. Uh, okay, uh, Brian, can I take a look at uh, 
what we've got from social media. <coughs> This one would be a good one because we could uh, we've got an associated video. You mentioned your speech short form, user generated content. Uh, how would that work? I mean, because we're thinking of you guys as more traditional film and television. So, what, what shape does that take for relativity? Um, I think we we brought a bunch of videos. Do we have the? I don't know if they've got set up. Do we have the uh, relativity vengeables video by any chance available, guys? Yeah. Anyone in the back? We do. Um, so, so we'll, we'll just give a little background sure. on this. Um, uh, we come prepared with lots of videos for questions. It's easier for them to answer than me. Uh, so this is actually just an example of, it's clearly, it's short form. We did it last week. It, it's just something we did for fun that me, if I was the consumer relativity, and I said, oh, I want to have, in this case, it's our athletes. You know, these athletes, you know, star in a program, and this is what I want the program to be about. Now this is just a 30 second or 45 minute, a minute fun video about relativity, which obviously for me is personal, but imagine if you had four million consumers or five million consumers able to interact and say, you know, I love these sports stars, I want, I'd love to see them in this show, or I like this idea, or we can put pilots on the air and say, here's 50 pilots, let everybody comment and we get enough comment and information, we'll actually create a show around it. So this is something that we did for almost no money, shot in a day, and just shows you where we were sitting around for fun and said, Let, let's just do this. So this is one consumers generated short form, but imagine what it would be if you had millions. Let's take a look. Do we have it up? I need I don't demand money. I demand the lives of everyone living on this earth. I have control of an asteroid that's hurtling towards Earth, and your planet will explode in less than 24 hours. As soon as I press the spot. Oops, I pressed it. Good luck. Mr. President, what are your orders? There's only one team with special powers that can save us now. Do you know who's going to tip me? Who's going to tip me? Who's going to tip me? Just give me those who's going to tip me, guys. Yeah, Mr. President, we got it. All right, boys, time to put on your big boy pants. Let's move out. Let's hurry up and save the world. I got two bad resilient weight on me and my chateau on the pieces. You must have been a holy man. Because he's holy. <laughs> yeah, guys. Now I'm going to try this. Woo! This is the way to fly. Woo! You up here? <laughs> you came to the wrong dojo. Die, Betty Tilly Benjamin. Betty Tilly
fun and we made it with no money, but it gives you an idea of how we took you know, some of the biggest sports stars in the world, surrounded just something fun, it could be any idea, threw together something funny in short form, but imagine if you had millions of people commenting where we actually, it wasn't a joke, but it was, it was real, and we were able to actually integrate all these worlds. And that was made by our TV department using our sports stars and, and produced by our film guys. Synergy in action. Ryan, thank you very much for coming today. Thank you.